Ideas we can use versus ideas we should lose. That's what I'm talking to you about in this episode of the Business of Agriculture. Hey, Damian Mason here with a question before we hop into this episode of the Business of Agriculture. If you farm for a living, you employ a lot of amazing technology from your inputs that you put into the soil to the tractor that you sit in, your combine, the amazing data that it harvests. But has your soil analytics kept up technologically with everything else in your farming operation? I would venture to say that no, it is not. Sure, you check for your nitrogen, your phosphorus, your potassium, your micronutrients as well. But what about disease pressure? Do you know what diseases and what pests you're going to face next year? No, you don't. But you can now figure that out with Pattern Ag's predictive analytics. Think about it. They can tell you now with testing what the likelihood of facing nasty diseases, things like cyst nematode or uh, sudden death syndrome, what the likelihood of you having this in your field, then you know how to prepare, how to treat, and where to invest your money. It's using technology to make you bigger yields and therefore make you bigger money. Go to www.pattern.ag to learn more. They are pioneering the way in predictive agronomy. Hey there, welcome to another fantastic episode of the Business of Agriculture with my good friends Pattern Ag and also Redox and True Terra bringing this episode to you. I want to talk to you about ideas. You know, I'm all about ideas. I'm an innovative guy. I'm a creative guy. I wrote a book about business called Do Business Better. It came out five years ago and it's all about entrepreneurialism. Love entrepreneurialism. Love that there's investment coming into the world's most important industry, us. Uh, here that work in agriculture uh, should be grateful for that. Well, I want to talk to you about some of the money and ideas that have poured into agriculture that I see from a different perspective, maybe even than you do. And that's because I'm on the road a lot. I see a lot of different subsects of the industry, but also I get pitched for this very show, folks that want to come on this show and talk about their, uh, their new venture. And sadly, I think that There's a lot of venture money that comes into agriculture, less now than there was a few years ago. We talk a lot about the money pouring into agriculture, and it seems to me there's a lot of money that's poured in that could probably be better utilized uh, somewhere else. Um, It seems like there's this thing that's happening. If you're not from the industry, if you didn't get raised on a farm like many of us did, and you haven't endeavored in here producing crops, livestock, whatever... I'm afraid that some of these folks sit around in their bubble, and it might be investor bubbles, it might be uh, Silicon Valley types, it might be the tech crowd, wherever they are, and it doesn't matter, but geography is not the main thing, it's circle. If they're around a lot, if they're circled by a lot of folks that say, hey, we really need to fix this problem, and I think if you read too many New York Times articles or certain classification of media, you're going to be convinced that there's some realities that aren't so. For instance, I get pitched routinely, and I mean like multiple per week, folks that want to come on this show and talk about their new product, idea, innovation, uh, website that is going to save us all from certain starvation that is going to be hinged on, principled on climate crisis. First off, I I don't believe we are in climate crisis. I believe there's a great deal of climate hysteria. I believe there's a great deal of people profiting and attempting to profit off of the idea that we're all going to die from climate. But I don't know that it has any basis in fact. And I'm not getting into the whole climate change argument. I'm just telling you we're producing more yields every year on a trend line than we ever have. Uh, We're remarkable at production. And we can talk about, you know, a little bit of warming in the Alberta and the uh, the provinces of Canada and how it's opened up yield potential up there. If you really want to get into this whole climate thing, we can talk about the fact that in the deep south, my friend Matt Miles is growing corn uh, in the deep south for the first time since 2009. They never grew corn. So the whole idea that we are incapable of growing food because of climate crisis is ludicrous. We're still oversupplied. Go back and listen to the past episodes I did with Todd Thurman. We are 35% still, 35 to 40% of the food we produce globally, we waste. We don't even harvest it. When we harvest it, we dump it. We drive over it. On the way to the, on the, on the, way to the processing plant, we, get, we let it spoil. We don't have good infrastructure. We are 40, 35 to 40% plus oversupplied on food products. So the idea that somehow climate crisis is going to be our impending doom or about to starve in another year or two or a decade is just ludicrous. I see a lot of pitches about this. I really genuinely do. And I'm, I'm telling you this because I just want 
to give you the the pitches that are out there, the ideas, the innovations, the the money being spent, and how much of it's attempting to fix a problem that we don't have. And then I'm going to wrap up this episode by telling you about the problems that we do have and where I believe, where I believe we could and should, you know, like I said, um, put the money. Uh, ideas we can use versus ideas we can lose and then the funding that goes with that. One year ago, I released an episode that I recorded with my buddy Rob Syke, a uh, Canadian entrepreneur, agricultural entrepreneur, uh, author of the book uh, Food 5.0, um, the founder of a company called um, AgVisor Pro. And we asked the question, if I had a billion dollars, if I just came to you, I'm an investor, and I came to you, or investors came to me with $1 billion and said, I've got this billion dollars, I want return on it. It doesn't need to be 80% returns. I don't expect some, you know, I just want a good return and I want this to be deployed somewhere that's going to be absolutely a brilliant place to put it in agriculture. Where do you put it? And that's a tough question. You know, I'm not talking about, okay, buy a billion dollars with a farm ground or buy a billion dollars with a stock in some ag company. I'm just saying, where do you put it in a business venture? How do you split it up? Split it up 10 ways, $100 million each way. The point is, we asked this question a year ago, and if you are interested and you didn't catch that episode, go back and listen to it. But I'm telling you now, ideas we can use versus ideas we should lose is is where I am right now because I see so many, so many ideas that are actually businesses and look to have funding. Um, I've seen presenters at ag conferences get on stage and talk about these things. I've seen non-agricultural people come into agriculture well-funded well-intentioned generally, but not well-versed. And I, I don't want to insult them in any way. And there's always a peril to pretending just because I'm the farm boy with a degree in agriculture and, and you are too, or the farm girl that was raised in Kansas and you, that doesn't mean that these people that come from outside of our industry are stupid. They certainly are not. doesn't mean that they're clueless. They're just a little bit, shall I say, well-intentioned oftentimes, but misguided. And I'm going to get into that in a second. Um, so that's where we're covering here, and I, I, I know I, we run the risk of sounding a little bit arrogant. Not that at all. Not anti-idea. I'm not the old grumpy, uh, you know, bumpkin down at the coffee shop, uh, griping and bitching about everybody that comes to this industry from outside of it and calling them carpetbaggers. No, I'm not doing that at all. But let me just kind of give you an example. I just gave you the climate one, and and I am genuinely not can, kidding when I tell you <laughs> there's a remarkable amount of companies, I don't know how big they are. Uh, they come across my desk. My wife compiles them and she says, this company wants to be on your podcast. This company wants to talk to you. And their whole thing is they're going to help us on food production because of climate crisis. And they're going to do this because of climate crisis, climate crisis. I just can't tell you enough how overdone that is. I know why it is. You do too. Remember, we just passed the Inflation Creation, I'm sorry, Inflation Reduction Act here in the United States a year or so ago, $1.7 trillion of new spend, which means it's going to contribute to inflation for years to come. $900 billion of that had a climate slash environmental component to it. So if you toss almost a trillion dollars from the world's largest economy, the United States, at this thing, and that's not even talking about the USDA money. Remember, we've been hearing about climate smart agriculture now for about a year. Secretary Vilsack is incapable of saying one paragraph that does not at least include one reference to climate smart agriculture. It's part of his thing. It's kind of like those NASCAR drivers that they have to make sure they mention their team and their <laughs> and their sponsors and every uh, other sentence. That's Vilsack on climate smart agriculture. So I understand why there's this race to put your money and your innovation and your technology into something and then package it as climate, climate, climate. I'm telling you, it's not at the end of the day, generally, if it's supposed to be, we won't be able to grow food if we don't do this, again, that's misguided. Look at the yields. Look at our po our possibility, our productive capacity. Um, we've heard about the Brazilian soils being more fragile and in need of more inputs than some of the, say, great prairie soils of Iowa. Uh, sure, great, wonderful. But we've been hearing that for 50 years, and they're still cranking out double crop, you know, double crops out of Brazil. Um, We've heard about some of the other issues, and it just hasn't materialized. So I'm going to go through where I think some of the some of the ideas that we could use uh, should go, and I'm going to tell you about some of the ideas we should lose. Just for the fun of it, let me go ahead and uh, show you this. 
uh, just a couple of the pitches. Before I do that, I want to talk to you about premium plant nutrition with the added benefit of biostimulants. That's what my friends at Redox do. No one does it better than Redox Bionutrients. It's a family business in Idaho, been around for 30 years, uh, founded by Darren Moon uh, out of Burley, Idaho. Started on specialty crops, uh, worked their way into turf, and now covering increasingly broad acre. You're talking about, again, biostimulants uh, and plant nutrition. So Redox has a special pallet program for Midwest uh, producers. If you're a corn and soybean person here in the Midwest, you can get uh, a new product back, Max. I'm sorry, batch from them. It's uh, providing breakthrough nitrogen optimization with a product called RDXN, in addition to two of their flagship products, Banks, B-A-N-X, and Mainstay. You can find out more at redoxgrows.com slash Midwest. Redox, R-E-D-O-X, Redox grows.com slash Midwest. They've got a special program for Midwest producers where you can get a pallet of three of their products and begin using them. Okay. Um, I get, this one here is kind of an interesting one. It's called freight farms, growing influence and sustainable agriculture. Again, a lot of these things are all about sustainable climate, sustainable climate, sustainable climate. And again, that's fine. I don't mind. I understand why they're doing that. But what I want to kind of throw out there to you is this one is their whole pitch. This company's pitch is they want to take freight containers, which I thought there weren't enough of just a few years ago when we couldn't get supply, when we had the supply chain crisis. They want to take used freight containers, and you see this all over the place, freight containers to be houses, freight containers turned into swimming pools, freight containers turned into bomb shelters, freight containers turned into uh, man rooms and she sheds in the backyard. Well, this one wants to take freight containers and turn them into sustainable agriculture. And the idea is they put in a water percolation system and some LED lights, and you have your own little uh, 40 foot, I think is what they are, 40 foot by 10 foot um, freight container turned into a farm and you can put this in your backyard now the question i'm gonna throw out there is i've lived in suburbia maybe you have maybe you have not did you ever live in a subdivision where they said you know what we really want we want to encourage everybody to bring a metal freight container and drop it in their backyard hey i'll put it in the front yard we think they're lovely to look at and turn it into a farm okay that doesn't normally happen. So I think this is, again, it's a, somebody sat around and said, well, we have to have sustainable, because some of this goes on to say, growing concerns about climate-induced agricultural hurdles like extended droughts, failing crops. It goes on to talk about how we will clearly not be able to produce food, even though that's not true, and how freight containers can pave the way to food security. And food security is very important, obviously, the 10% or so of the world's population that are food insecure, you'd like them to have food. So would I. I don't know that they're going to be able to buy one of these because this is actually gearing this toward more of a yuppie market. So it's gearing a expensive product, a freight container with a whole bunch of hydroponic technology to grow your own food with LED lights. The people that could use something like this can't afford it. Those that can't afford it will think it's a neat idea at first, kind of like buying a Prius, except for the problem is a Prius, all you got to do is plug it in and go and drive around. Tesla, plug it in, drive around, prove that you care about the environment more than your neighbors because you're driving a hybrid car. This, you actually have to do the work. That's where there's a flaw in this reasoning. Remember during the whole pandemic when everybody said, I'm going to start gardening and candy, couldn't get jars. I'm trying to make pickles like I've been making pickles for years, making sauerkraut because I make sauerkraut. And it's damn good. Thank you very much. I couldn't get jars to do pickles and kraut because everybody in the year 2020 decided they were going to become uh, off the grid. Uh, you know, they're going to work from home, stay at home, off the grid, and they're going to make their own food. The thing is, it lasted for a couple of months. The whole gardening thing fizzled. You couldn't get seeds during 2020. Well, by 2021, you get all the garden seeds you want. You get all the jars you wanted. You get all the canning supplies because it lasted very, very <laughs> short-lived, shall we say. Same thing, I think, for this. You tell me the people that you know that want badly enough to go and spend the money buy an expensive freight container, put it in their property to make an indoor farm, very small scale, shall we say. Um, and they, I think you're going to find out not very many people, if they cared that much about it, they'd already have a garden. They would already have an indoor garden. They would have an outdoor garden. They would have a greenhouse, which would be a hell of a lot easier to start than one of these. You can build a greenhouse for about a couple thousand bucks. But the point is, I'm not against this. I just want to point out this is an idea that has funding and one of their big points here at Freight Farms, they want a uh, container farm adoption across nonprofit healthcare and education sectors. So they kind of already know that you and me and 
our neighbors in suburbia aren't probably going to buy one of these. So you know what they might do? They might just go to a healthcare system, maybe a nonprofit healthcare system and get them to buy one. And that way they can talk about how uh, there's some herbs in the hospital cafeteria and the hospital cafeteria made those herbs out here. And it cost $61 per pound because it's very expensive to do this versus just buying your herbs from Cisco or from the grocery store. The point I'm making here is... This is a, an idea we should probably lose. I can go on, but I'll just throw you one more. Space farming. So spa- okay, if you're listening to this, I'm holding these sheets up because these are kind of funny to me. Space farming and sustainable development. Remember, if it's going to have money behind it, and it's going to be a venture. It's got to have the words climate and sustainable. And space farming and sustainable development. What do they have in common? As our planet, again, this is the pitch. As our planet grapples with environmental challenges such as climate change and resource depletion. If you think I sound like a broken record, it's only because every pitch that we get, and these are never companies that want to hire me to speak because they're companies that don't even have a following. They don't even have any customers. They don't even have any revenue in large part. They have an idea. They have investors. They have maybe a technology, maybe a few freight containers sitting around with some LED packages and a hydroponic plan on how they're going to help somebody learn how to grow herbs in a freight container in their backyard. But what they don't generally have is an actual meeting, customers, uh, events, and things like that. So I don't work with them. I just get pitched on them on how they should come on this show. I protect you from them coming on here because I think most of these things are goofy ass, completely ridiculous, ludicrous, unprofitable, never will actually see a... uh, a, a black uh, a black piece of ink on the on the balance sheet or on the PL statement because you know why they're going to be in the red until the investor money goes away and then they'll go completely out and I'm not being mean I'm just saying space farming and sustainable development again it's about climate change so what this company is proposing is that it's so difficult to grow food here because of this climate crisis that we're experiencing that we can't grow food in Nebraska somehow. We can't produce produce in Florida. Somehow we just can't grow lettuce in Yuma, Arizona, according to this. So we're going to do this. We're not going to move it offshore. We're not going to go to Africa. We're not going to go to Central America. We're going to go to space. Now, do you see why I almost become animated about how damn silly this is we're gonna move we're gonna move our we're gonna move our food production to space now i want to just preface this i'm recording this in summer of 2024 it was just about six months ago in the last six months we tried to put we private industry using 2024 2023 technology attempted to put attempted to put another lunar space program together and failed so we're going to now try and grow food in outer space. The private into the private sector has proven we can't even get to the moon again if we ever got to the first time. But the point I'm going to point out here is now we're going to grow food out there. One thing that I would like to point out, if we're wasting almost 40 percent of the food we grow here in the world on Earth here at Terra, uh, if we grow almost 40 percent more food than we ever actually consume here on Earth because we just waste it. What the hell are we going to do about the food that's out there in outer space? How are we going to get it back to here? Or is it supposed to be for planetary development so that we have something to eat when we're out in, you know, in, in the galaxy? I, I Sure, that's important. I would understand that. But there's some, shall I say, issues with growing food out there. Um, do you have light? If it's a plant-based product, we need photosynthesis. Photosynthesis requires light. Um, do you have water? No life as we know it can exist without water. I'm just throwing out some of the obvious hurdles, not to mention who's your consumer. Is your customer going to grow food out in space, space farming, and then bring it back to the United States? Seems like there could be some transportation issues with that. Given that we are told repeatedly by the greenies that local food is better for the environment, even though largely it is not proven out to be that way, still a lot of times it's better and more uh, efficient from a resource standpoint to grow produce in Florida and truck it to Cleveland, Ohio, than to try and grow it in Cleveland, Ohio, especially during the uh, non-season, which would be much of the year because it's winter up there nine months of the year. The point is, if we think that non-local food is bad for the environment, what the hell are we to think about food that comes from outer space? Again, these are just some of the many, many, two of the many, 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 many ideas that I have pitched to me, companies that are uh, venturing into this, ideas we can lose. Let's talk about ideas we could use. You see, I think that the problem is 
a lot of folks that are not from agriculture come up with these ideas and then they get in their country club circle, their investor circle. They, they pitch this idea to other folks and they said, you know, that's great. And they are largely motivated by this, this boogeyman known as climate crisis. And they have been told that the cows are making a, ruining the environment. They've been told that by Bill Gates and they've been told that by Jeffrey Bezos and uh, whoever else has invested in synthetic meat companies largely is who's perpetuating that misinformation. And they've been told from Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez that, um, you know, if we eat meat, we're going to all, the planet's going to die in 12 years and that's nowhere close to true. And she predicted that about four years ago and I guess we're uh, one third of the way there. There's this motivation based on misinformation. Okay. Fine. I don't care. We're not getting political here. I'm just telling you that if you truly believe that climate crisis is making us unable to produce food, just look at the data. Please ask an agricultural person. Come and ask one of us. We are adapting and adopting every day to weather to produce food. Look, you know, in Illinois, we're still able to grow corn and soybeans, and, and we're still able to grow wheat in Washington State. I mean, we can go on about this whole thing. So I'm going to say that it's unfortunately, uh, foundationed on a lot of, um, shall I say, hype and hysteria. But let's talk about the ideas that we can use. My suggestion, <clears throat> share this with your investor friends, share this episode with those that are, uh, that you see outside of agriculture. I have the, I have the fortune of living in the suburbs of Phoenix, Arizona half the year and traveling in, around a lot of non-ag people in my journeys as opposed to a lot of us that work in ag who are only ever around ag people. And so when I am propositioned by these people about what's going on in our industry, they oftentimes say, well, I heard this and I heard that. And I'm like, yeah, that's not actually, that's not really foundationed and in, in accurate uh, data. So I have to a lot of times tell them, no, um, you know, <laughs> no, it's not true that Monsanto, uh, you know, holds a gun to farmer's head and makes them buy their seed. I, I've been told that before by non-ag people. No, it's not true that um, that we can't grow food because of uh, because of uh, climate change. No, it's not true that uh, that, uh, you know, workers in a beef yard are all dying from methane poisoning. I mean, whatever these things are that people come up with. So one thing I would ask is. Ask us what we need or where we think the issue is. And there's a problem with that, too, because those of us those of us who work in ag tend to usually think like producers. And producers usually think in terms of how can I make more? How can I make more and make more cheaper? And that puts us in commodity mindset. You've heard me talk about that quite a bit. So what we oftentimes focus on is production and efficiencies, production and efficiencies. And we've pretty well got that covered. Most new innovation that I see coming across the, at these meetings I attend, they're talking a lot about innovation and innovation in ag usually means more with less, more productivity with less, bigger, bigger equipment, bigger machines, bigger testing, bigger scale, bigger production, more efficiently, more efficiently, more efficiently. That's been our thing for decades since before I was born. I want to challenge you, I think ideas that we could use versus ideas we could should lose, I want to challenge you to think about margin. And I'll tell you why. We are this hugely com capitalized business, millions and millions of dollars, real estate, machinery, facilities, grain bins, barns, processing, with very, very little, itty bitty little margins. No other industry wants to work, uh, almost no other industry, I should say, commodity producers do, uh, from copper to coal to whatever, they usually work on very, very small margins, as do weeks. We're commodity mindset, we're commodity producers. So I want to tell you, if we could use ideas, ideas we could use versus lose, if you want to come to us with outside money and innovators and outside uh, technology, we're welcoming it. You know, autonomous tractors, I think that there's going to be some brilliant things. Autonomous machinery, I think it's going to come from some outside. I think that the big manufacturers of machinery are good, but I think that some of the new technology clearly already is happening. We're seeing it from upstarts that then get bought by them. But what now about beyond just efficiency, beyond just becoming more efficient? What about an idea, an innovation that creates demand? We did that with ethanol albeit we needed some legislation to make that happen to require the renewable fuel standards. We're going to probably see that with um, airline uh, aviation fuel, uh, sustainable aviation fuel. We're going to probably see that if we see soy and canola-based oil become diesel. We're going to probably need a legislative shot in the arm to make that happen, uh, to make a requirement. 
but could we figure out a way to increase demand? Because every day we're making more stuff. Here in the United States, we grow about 50% more corn and 50% more soybeans than we did just at the turn of the century. Remember Y2K? That was only 24 years ago. We're growing almost 50% more corn and soy than we did then. You want to come up with an idea for agriculture? Let's figure out how to utilize what we have. Another idea, that's demand. Because when we usually think about demand, we think about going and finding more countries to trade with. What if those countries are already supplied? So I've got ideas largely on that, about demand increases. I've got three more places where I think we should apply energy. Before I do that, I want to tell you about True Terra, because I want to talk to you about money. As you know, I'm all about business. That's why we call it the Business of Agriculture show. We're heading into a little bit of a tougher time out here in rural America. You're going to be making less money if you are endeavoring in agriculture. USDA projects we're going to be 40% off of the revenue we attained just two years ago in 2022. If that's the case, you need to make every nickel you can off of your acres. And maybe you can do that through diversification. Truterra can help you do that. Truterra is focused on supporting farmers at every stage in the sustainability journey to help you make, maintain, and uh, create regenerative management practices. Maybe it's strip tilling. Maybe it's nitrogen reduction. Maybe it's no-till. What about cover crops? Things you can do, maybe you're already doing them on acres that you have, and you can get paid for those practices. It's about economics, it's about agronomics, it's about environmental sustainability, and it's also about your bottom line. Go to TruTerraAg.com, TruTerra, part of the Lando Lakes uh, umbrella, TruTerraAg.com to find out more. Okay, so if I think ideas we could use, let's talk about demand creation, any single thing. Now, I know it's a little bit small scale. I remember reading about a company that was taking a straw, a byproduct, obviously, of crop production, and working it into making it an insulation. Uh, and then we get away from some of that nasty stuff, mineral wool and rock wool that becomes very itchy. It's pollusive to make it. You've got to use, uh, you know, coal and coke uh, and, and uh, furnaces. I worked in a rock wool factory, uh, rock wool factory when I was in college. I understand the process. What if we could use some of our byproducts uh, for the cellulosic part of it uh, for insulation or building materials? We see some of this. It doesn't usually get lift. And maybe it's because we're going against the Owens Cornings of the world, if you will. We're going against the large-scale manufacturers of building materials. What if instead of going against them, we parted with them? That's one place where I could see this whole thing coming together. The whole climate agenda, the sustainable agenda, the monies from the government, the trillion dollars that's being blown out here, and also then building materials. Sustainable building materials that are also an agricultural product. Can we make something like that work? I'm not the scientist, but I have read the articles, and so have you. We're talking about an agricultural product that then goes into building materials. I think there's something there. Create demand. We've already talked about fuel, sustainable aviation fuel, ethanol, etc., that requires legislation to make that happen. What about another issue? Because we think of demand, we always think about going ac to, across the pond and finding another country to buy our crap. It's not crap, I'm being funny. Our crops, our foodstuffs. Well, that's getting more competitive. You know, the rest of the world has learned to make food also. So what about instead of just demand, we talk about increasing demand uh, with non-food products. That's what I was just talking about right there. Then let's talk about um, water. If you want to talk about an idea we could use versus ideas we should lose, almost none of the things that come across my desk, these companies, are talking about the elephant in the room, and that is water, particularly west of the river, meaning the western United States. Much of the acreage that is farmed is struggling because of access to, in about seven states, the Ogallala Aquifer. The Ogallala Aquifer is being uh, depleted. We've been hearing about this since the 1980s access to water. What if instead of access to water, because then it becomes the political part, like the California reservoirs, etc. What about instead of just access to water, we began policing ourselves. We began methodology within agriculture with uh, somehow working with or not even with governments to make it so we policed ourselves and we were better at utilization of our own water. More importantly, what if we were able to switch away, bring me the technology that can make it so we can use less water? Why are we still cultivating the ground in the panhandle of Texas? Cultivation gets rid of water. Why are we still growing corn in areas like western Kansas where there's eight inches of precipitation? I know why we do it, because it's always made sense to do so, because we could feed the cattle yards that are there. I understand that. My point is, from an environmental standpoint, but more importantly, from a looming environmentalist and legislative standpoint, I think you're going to have a regulatory issue that's going to probably start coming down on you. What if we brought ideas in that actually sought to help us there? 
sought to help us in ways to conserve and use less water. Yeah, I know it's happening. I know that our irrigation systems are roughly 20 or 30 percent more efficient than they were just a few decades ago. But is that enough? So if you ask me where could we take some money and put it into things and some ideas we could use, I'd say anything involving water. That is going to be the new currency in agriculture, I believe, because of a few reasons. The reality of depleting aquifers. Uh, the fact that we are fairly oversupplied, so there's going to start to become a realization. If we're oversupplied and we're looking for ways to burn up our corn through ethanol, uh, through sustainable aviation fuel, why are we still using irrigation water in parts of the country to grow corn? That's where I think water is going to become a new currency and anything that involves water. So if you want to know an idea, we could use anything involving water, decreasing the usage of it, um, finding crops we can grow, making crops that we can grow with less water. I know that some of the seed companies are working on this, but I still see an an under an under emphasis there and then i want to go another direction anything on margin we are so low margined everything we talk about here we're talking about a u.s department of agriculture that's probably going to, to keep food supplies high and crop levels up we're going to probably uh look at um you know subsidies it, it generally happens right there We've got to have to bring the bring the American farmer back to some level of solvency so that we don't end up having a, a washout and therefore we have food insecurity. So what that really boils down to is margins and about everything we talk about. I mean, my buddy Todd Thurman, host of the Business of Agriculture Success Group with me, which you should be a member of, by the way, for just 99 bucks a month. You can be a member of the Business of Ag Success Group. It's a networking group for ag professionals. We bring in guest speakers every two weeks on a Zoom call. You should be a part of it. Anyway, Todd's in the pork business. What's he tell you? <laughs> he tells you the pork industry is back where it's been so much of the time. It's working on almost zero margin and continues to just consolidate. Well, consolidation doesn't create demand nor create more margin. All it does is decrease some expense levels and bring you down to economies of scale. Well, what if we had ideas that came in our industry that didn't just create economies of scale, but instead created new economies? And that's where I would love to see more emphasis, more investment, more ideas, more innovation come into our field because I know that the margins are very low and they have been for a long time. This brings me to my next thing, ideas we can use. I still think there's a, a, a place for value added food. We right now are dealing with food inflation, which has caused some consumers, particularly the lower one third, one fourth of our socioeconomic uh, strata cut back drastically on their food spend. No, they're still buying food, but they're going, they're trading down. We always talk about the trade down, but largely, even though we're in our fifth year, fourth year, let's say, of rampant food inflation, we still have a consumer that's holding up pretty well. Restaurant spending is up, but it's not just restaurant spending up because the portions cost more. There seems to be going out more, believe it or not. Almost like the long hangover from the whole pandemic thing is people said, screw it, I'm still going to go out and eat dinner. My family is still going to go out to have dinner. So if there still is spend here in summer of 2024, in our fourth year of pretty much increased food inflation to where I thought this is definitely going to start to hurt the consumer, it tells me that there's still a place for value added food products. And we see it. We, you know, we go to the Whole Foods or the Trader Joe's or even the fancy aisle uh, at your Kroger. And now Walmart has fancy food also, less of it on a percentage basis. But the point is, is there room for ideas for agricultural higher end product? Uh, we see the direct to consumer beef packages, the direct to consumer butcher boxes, if you will, or uh, uh, these different companies are doing that. I don't think it's tapped out yet. And so this is where I would say ideas we could use, anything that boosts margins and gives the consumer a good feel. We still in agriculture, in production agriculture, still think it's all about how cheap we can be. I hear it all the time. I hear it all the time from people that are in, in this industry. Well, Dame, you know what? It all just comes down to whoever can produce the cheapest food. And I'm like, that's, that's not true. If that were true, there wouldn't be 4,000 plus Whole Food outlets because there's not one frickin' item inside the Whole Foods that is sold by being the cheapest uh, in its category. In fact, they would probably, if you told them this is cheaper here than it is over at Kroger, they, the store manager would probably block the aisle, run down there, and change the price and increase it immediately. So I still believe there's an opportunity there. Is it a bad time right now because of our being in our fourth year of food inflation? Maybe. 
but I also see a lot of money floating around out here where there could be something there. Where else do I think there are ideas we could use? Ideas we could use anything that's environmental but an actual play. We've seen like the methane. We've seen the livestock thing. And it could play into some of these new programs that we're hearing about that are part of climate smart agriculture, et cetera. It looks like those things are going to happen, but I don't know. I've always been a little bit gun shy of anything that was predicated on a government program. Uh, and then all of a sudden we're going to be grants, et cetera. So I'm not sure yet. I am going to be digging into that on this very show. So where I see ideas we could use, I say value added anything, value added food. I see uh multi-dimensional usage of our products. I see anything that can be environmental in terms of building products and consumer products. I don't know why the hemp thing still hasn't caught on. I would say anything in agriculture that could, and this is out there, I will grant you, but an environmental play, there's a headline just today, just today, I'm recording this in the summer of 24, about the evils of blue jeans. Because if you're fashionable, and you buy blue jeans, and you only wear them a couple of times. I can't imagine that. If I buy a pair of blue jeans, I've got I've got dad jeans. I've got jeans that are like six, eight, ten years old. But allegedly, some of these people that are more fashion forward buy a pair of jeans only wear it a few times. And there's a whole point about how bad that is for the environment. The production of the cotton, then obviously the indigo and the dyes, and then the shipping the product around from uh, the south. To, to somewhere in Asia is where it could be made into textiles, then it could be sewn into jeans, then shipped back here and sold at the Gap or whatever store they're sold at. The point I would say is, is there a play there that still puts agriculture as the producer of the cotton, and that's a good thing, but also alleviates the environmental downstream degradation? Because generally, I would like the environmental focus to get the hell off of us. I would like the target to get off of our back and go on to the fashion industry or the retail industry instead of us. Because the environmental thing seems to be very misplaced. So any new technology, an idea that we could use would be anything that removes the environmental target on our backs and puts it on the other areas. And maybe that's a recycling program. I'm not sure I completely know, but I can tell you of all the innovations I see, I see that being a good one. Demand increases, demand uh, refocusing and demand increases, margin increases, water issues, and moving the environmental uh, burden, or shall I say the environmental uh, bad guy, boogeyman off of us onto another sector, uh, shall I say, upstream or downstream for us would certainly sure as hell help. And then the other thing I want to tell you is on value added food. I still believe the marketplace is rife with that. And there's a lot of room for that. We've got smaller families. We have a consumer that continues to spend right now, despite my predictions, it was going to really start to get tight by now, by the fourth year of food inflation. So I think there's still an opportunity there. The one good thing is in a consumer place, whether you agree with it or not, a consumer marketplace where we've got young kids that buy $5 coffee drinks or $7 coffee drinks, we have a consumer marketplace that will um, go to uh, great lengths to buy things like uh, uh, grass-fed uh, organic, et cetera, that hasn't let up. I think there's still opportunity there. Um, I'm all about ideas. I'm all about innovation. I told you that at the start of this show. I can tell you that when I get pitches for farming in space because it's more sustainable and more climate friendly, you might imagine that my bullshit meter goes off as should yours. When I, when I hear about how uh, every, every house in America is going to have their own little farm in a recycled, repurposed, I should say, repurposed uh, shipping container in their backyard, I call BS on that also, as I'm sure you would. And that's why we know the reality is consumers will continue to buy what we produce because we're darn good at it. We're amazing at it, in fact. We've made it so the consumers don't have to have a container buried in their backyard where they can grow their own food. If you want to, that's fine. I'm all about being prepared. I'm just saying this is never going to become a reality. It's never going to come to fruition. So why are you spending your ideas and your investment on these ludicrous ideas when I've just given you ideas in agriculture that you go after? I could also go through the whole thing about what about what about technology that uh, continues to conserve the resources we have? What about technology that continues to preserve and conserve our soil, the most important asset we have? What about technologies and ideas that can take care of our labor problem, because that probably is the one I didn't get on, but you and I both know is the biggie. Yes, robotics. 
again, most of the technologies that are presented to agriculture are all about increasing efficiencies, bigger, bigger, bigger. What if it's smaller? What if it's autonomous? What's, what if it's robotic? What if it's swarm? What if it's Elon Musk said that we are eventually, he said this four years ago, we were a few years away from being to where manual labor is a choice. Well, I'm still waiting on that. So you know what? If you're listening to this and you want to know where to deploy your resources of money and innovation and ingenuity, how about taking care of our labor problem? Because that is probably the biggie. I gave you four and then I gave you the closer. Labor. That's where we still need the most help in this industry. Alleviate our need for foreign-born workers, alleviate our need for uh, for so much back-breaking work that we still are going to uh, struggle to get people to show up and do it. That's where the future lies. Water, demand creation, not non-food uh, usage of our products, anything that boosts our margin, value-added food, there's still a marketplace there, and labor. That's where I would put innovation and ideas we can use versus when we can ones we should lose so next time thanks for being here i really appreciate it if you have a, a recommendation for a topic you'd like me to cover please send it um i've been doing this for now 350 plus episodes and really glad to have you here thanks to pattern ag thanks to redox thanks to our friends at true terra till next time i'm damian mason and this is the business of agriculture well, that concludes another fantastic episode of the Business of Agriculture. This episode was brought to you by Pattern Ag. You know, everybody in agriculture understands the importance of soil health. We also keep an eye on our soil better than we ever did through advanced soil testing. But what if there was a company that provided predictive analytics? Not just checking out nutrients and all the elements that are in there, but also could tell you the degree of risk you face with disease and pest pressure. That's right. Pattern Ag can do that. They actually can tell you, hey, you're going to have a real issue here. You can preemptively, proactively treat for corn rootworm or cyst nematode or sudden death syndrome before the problem actually starts costing you yield. Go to pattern.ag. That's www.pattern.ag to find the nearest rep that can help you start doing better for your soil. 